<clears throat> Thank you very much. It is, it is my pleasure to introduce Tom Hendricks this morning, our first of an annual Distinguished Plate Eris Lecture. And it's a delight for me to introduce Tom because long before uh, Facebook Friends was a thing, uh, Tom was a task conference friend. Uh, we would see each other every year and have some wonderful conversations. And uh, I, I treasure his friendship over these years, so this is really a delight for me. Let me begin with the resume <coughs> portion of the introduction. Tom is a professor of sociology and distinguished university professor at Elon University. During his 40 years at Elon, Tom has also served as chair of the sociology department, associate dean of academic affairs, and dean of the division of social sciences. In addition to his numerous contributions to scholarly journals, Tom is the author of four books, including his most recent play in the human condition, which I believe is still on sale out there, which was published in 2015. He is one of the co-editors of the two-volume Handbook of the Study of Play, which was also published in 2015. And in recognition of his scholarly contributions to the study of play, Tom was awarded the Brian Sutton Smith Play Scholar Award by our, our organization in 2016. Now I would like to introduce Tom using some of his own words. In the acknowledgment section of his 2006 book, Play We Considered, Tom said the following, quote, I would thank first my colleagues at TASP, the Association for the Study of Play, by welcoming and responding thoughtfully to scholarly work of all types. The members of that organization have provided the playful space for my theoretical reckonings to take shape and grow. Well, on behalf of TASP, I would like to thank Tom for sharing those theoretical reckonings with us over the past years. There was a connectedness to Tom's annual presentations that led us to anticipate where those reckonings had taken him during the intervening year. And we looked forward to seeing where his stack of overhead transparencies would lead us each year as well. And those transparencies were not trying to answer simple questions. At the beginning of his latest book, Play in the Human Condition, Tom starts by asking, quote, how do we discover who we are? How do we determine the character of the world in which we live? And how do we decide what we can do in a world so configured? For Tom, the answer to those questions, in part at least, rests on the human predisposition to play. At the end of his book, Play Reconsidered, Tom writes this about the importance of play. Quote, play gathers together the emotional, cognitive, and moral dimensions of existence into sharply distilled moments. In such ways, human capacity is diversified and thickened, and societies themselves are made stronger. I'll close this introduction by retelling an anecdote that Tom shared at the Elon dinner commemorating his being named a distinguished university professor in 2003. <laughs> Tom shared a story from his very first day of teaching at Elon in 1977. It was a first class session and Tom was going over the course syllabus, requirements, expectations, and goals. While he was taking, talking, he noticed that the attention of one of the students seemed to be drifting away. And he saw that the student's gaze was not on the professor in front of the room, but through an open door and down a hallway, perhaps to someone standing in that hallway. Then Tom heard the student say in slightly too loud a voice, this son of a bitch is going to keep us the whole time. <laughs> Tom, this morning, 40 years later, will be very happy if you keep us the whole time. <laughs> Thank you, David. I thank uh, David in my book uh, for all we've meant to each other through the years, and I thank you again formally here. Thank you all for uh, coming. Uh, thanks to Walter and Marsha and Alice and so many members of the steering group for uh, asking me to uh, do this. A special thanks to Walter for organizing uh, such a good conference, uh, a yearly ritual where we can work and play and commune, to use some of my own language. So thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, you can see my topic up there on the board. I, I think I'll try not to stand in front of it.
Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Uh, you have a handout. Uh, Eric Erickson once teased, paraphrasing uh, Abraham Lincoln, that uh, charts are the sort of thing that's helpful to the sort of person who's helped by that sort of thing. And uh, <laughs> Erickson was a chart maker. Uh, I am too. Uh, uh, Peter Gray said last time, we're sort of a handsy species. We're a wordsy species too, but we're also a picture-making species, so I don't uh, apologize for that. I believe there's a sort of architecture to experience in existence, and uh, picture-making is one way we try to grasp that. I have uh, several commitments for this session. Uh, the first, I want to uh, uh, address uh, what I might call the mystification of play. Uh, like others here, I appreciate the fact that play can be a, uh, a red balloon filled with helium, a plastic play, a, a puffy shirt, a, a mystical unicorn. I, I support all that, but it, it can be other things as well, and we need to think hard about it. Uh, so that is one of my ambitions here. My second is a long uh, thing that I've maintained for quite a while, that the way to understand play is to compare it to other uh, behaviors. Uh, play has been haunted by an exceptionalism, which is that uh, play is different than everything else in the world, and we just need to focus on play. Uh, my view is that we understand it better if we try to see how it is connected to other basic things that human beings do. So that's a second theme. Uh, a third theme uh, related to those charts is uh, play is various. We're, we're clear about that. But uh, let's try to see first that it is a very basic thing, but that it spins out in complicated ways. and. Uh, if we can confront those complexities without losing its basicness, then we're on to something. At the end, if uh, time serves us well, we'll see how that goes. I'd like to, to stop talking and uh, have you folks do a short uh, writing thing, and I've got some prompts for that uh, regarding your own views of uh, what is to be done. So that first one. Uh, Brian Sutton Smith and uh, Diana Kelly Byrne, I think it's 1984, had an essay called The Idealization of Play. And their intention was not to hurt people's feelings, but uh, they felt that play was seen too positively, like that red balloon, that perhaps play can be other things, uh, perhaps it can be teasing and uh, impertinent and uh, even drifting toward meanness at times, and we need to confront that part of play as well. So I think I'm in the Sutton Smith tradition there. I do think we can go farther than this. Farther than this means let's try to take play apart. Play has been a glitter in generality, but let's try to take apart its uh, elements, much as uh, Peter Gray did. Uh, 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 just yesterday, I guess it was. Uh, you see, I've got up here uh, David Kushner's suggestion. This was my chance to get even with him. <laughs> you know, you know, abused me in the introduction. Uh, uh, whether it was when he was president, I think it was in his address, but it probably hit other points as well. David suggested, here's a thought for you. Uh, what if we conduct this conference without using the word play? Oh, that would be heretical, most of us thought. But I think my take on what he was saying was, no, that would force us to think harder about the elements of play. Uh, we, we, we go too easily to that uh, puffy shirt. We, we need to, particularly those who are interested in human learning, are there other categories and what aspects of play actually contribute to learning? So I'm in the Kushner tradition as well. My theme, I'm very committed to this and 
think I'm right, but I might not be. There's an Anthony Trollope novel, he knew he was right about this uh, 19th century uh, British uh, bourgeois type. He was just uh, convinced of something, and what he was convinced of was that his wife was having an affair. Well, he was wrong about it. He wasn't right, and it ruined his life, so I don't know that this will ruin my life, but uh, I am committed to this view. And the view is the way to understand play is to compare it to the other basic things that human beings do that doesn't diminish the status of play, it actually elevates the status of play. Uh, what are those other things? Uh, somebody once asked uh, <coughs> Sigmund Freud, uh, so what are the major commitments of life? And he supposedly mumbled, Arbeiten und Leben, uh, to work and to love. Uh, David Elkin, I think it was, said, well, yeah, Freud was on to something there, but uh, I think we should add play to that list. It is to play and to work and to love. Uh, I'm very influenced by a uh, professor of mine, Victor Turner, was an anthropologist, and he was very interested in ritual as a path of self-transformation and its connection to something called communitas, the kind of immersive bonding of human beings, like much of what we're doing here, and also to play. And he worked that territory, and uh, I'm, I'm, I'm depart from those four ideas that they're all fundamentally important things. Work is the strategy of doing something well, of perfecting a process of achieving ends of surviving. <coughs> Excuse me, <I'm coughs> my voice has been messed up. Uh, ritual is the path of, of discovering clear principles of order to guide our lives. That's tremendously important. Communitas is the, which most people just mix with play happily and perhaps that's fine. But for me, it's a quite a different thing. Meditating, communing, loving, that's not play to me. It's commitment to the process of integration, of bonding, that, that's a legitimate human endeavor of its own sort. And then there is play. The, uh, what most of us study, which involves the uh, strategy of uh, what I'm going to call goal attainment. Uh, it's never inappropriate at these meetings to uh, talk about uh, Brian Sutton Smith, not just to remember the past, but to get a purchase on our own uh, ways of thinking about play. That was his theme. It's going to be mine here too, but that was his theme, which is to make us self-conscious about the different uh, ideological camps in which we operate. So his book, uh, The Ambiguity of Play, 1997, I went to one of these theoretical addresses then, and at that one he talked about his book. And it, it's always interesting to hear authors <coughs> Think, uh, talk about what they think their work was about, and that's what he did there. I won't dwell on this, I'll go through it quickly. Uh, we belong to seven camps, or ideologies, or rhetorics. Most of us uh, happily live inside one of those camps for our whole lives, we never consider the others, but Sutton Smith was a pretty smart uh, man, and tremendously uh, knowledgeable about play, much more than I am, uh, much more than any person in this room. Uh, and he said, well, here's seven. Uh, people who study modern society, so many of them are what he would call in the uh, play as progress camp. Play something for little kids, play the way in which we develop skills and forms of awareness, play advances us in the world, young animals do it too, he's got two chapters in his book on that. It gra it's great, it moves its ahead, it's a form of pre-adaptation. Uh, many people in this room are play as progress people. Beyond that, some folks are, play is imaginative exploration. It's kind of the Freudian tradition. Uh, Jerome and Dorothy Singer have spoken at these meetings. Uh, that's their take as well. It is a place where people go to expand their, their understandings of who they are, to try out things in the mind. And then the third rhetoric was that some people are interested in the self 
uh, for Sutton Smith, that means kind of peak experiences, just the, the, the dwelling on the experience, possibilities of experience. Well, he says, those are fine ways of looking at play, but that's just one way. That's popular with biologists and psychologists, and he was a psychologist, popular with education people. That's only one way of looking at play. What's the other? Well, he was a folklore person, and he said, come on, there's a history, there's a anthropology, ever heard of anthropology? Uh, different societies <laughs> study play differently. It isn't just for kids, it's for adults. Some play is about competition and power. Uh, Johann Hoisinger, some guy I've uh, influenced me a lot. His stuff is about uh, the clash of, of groups and just power as a setting for figuring out who you are and what is possible. Uh, some play is about a community identity, kind of the drumbeat of, of the traditional society, the dance ground. Uh, that's what play is about. No, say, oh, there's play is about fate. It's about figuring out where you stand amidst the improbabilities of the universe. It's about gambling and risk-taking and uh, 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 Roger Caillois had uh, that uh, alia that play is very much about the consultation with fate. That's what play is about. No, no, uh, uh, it, it can be other things. It can be about the tradition of foolery, foolishness, silliness, status inversion, uh, ad busters, as, uh, as Shepard uh, tried to tell us the other day. That can be part of what play is. So most of us, I probably myself included, happily dwell in some of these camps. But uh, Sutton Smith said, come on, come on, embrace the fullness of play. Now he believed very much in that, that, that perhaps it was just so complicated that it would be ambiguous, that you could not exhaust the meanings of uh, play. I'm a little more like Peter Gray, which is I like to disambiguate play. Uh, he said when he talked in 1997 or 8, yeah, I did those first chapters, okay, but it took me about five years to do the uh, last chapter. Why is that? Well, the last chapter was the one where he tried to pull together what uh, play is in general. And he said then that it's kind of a form of pre-adaptation, I'll use that word. Uh, if you're a, some, some creatures can live at the bottom of the ocean, <laughs> just open and close their shell when creatures come by, they probably don't need to play. But uh, creatures that live in, in open, uh, complicated environments, mobile creatures, creatures who don't have some tremendously developed specific skill set, uh, they need a complicated behavioral array, a repertoire that allows them to handle many kinds of situations. And when we play, we prepare ourselves for the, uh, for the possible futures. And so his quote up there, which I don't think I'll read just for reasons of time, but it's about the exploration of variability in creatures. Play thickens our capabilities it uh, broadens our array. Uh, Peter mentioned that Fredrickson broaden and build approach to, uh, to uh, human functioning, but animal functioning as well. Uh, give me a broader skill set or educated creatures, he said. Uh, give me a broader skill set so that I can make my way through the world. Great book. Uh, <laughs> not, not my book, Brian's book, but like, like the rest of you, I, uh, I struggle with these issues and have for a long time. Uh, my play in the human condition uh, has a general theme, which is that play, and I think it unites all seven of his rhetorics, is a quest for a self-realization. Uh, I don't think it's just a modern rhetoric. I think that is fundamental to what play is. Anybody who makes a statement like that should address the terms of their statement. So here we go quickly. What are creatures like us and other creatures up to? I think we 
try to figure out where we stand in circumstances that existence is a, is a reconnoitering process of figuring out where we are in situations and what we can do there. And to do that, we develop systems of recognition and response, ways of figuring out, assessing ways of responding. And uh, I think that's true for every creature. We obviously have a more sophisticated, I don't know if they're more sophisticated, but a different sort of recognition system. But that is what existence is about, making your way through the world. Two, self, what's that? <clears throat> All of us have identities, you know, we're, we're recognized by people, by otherness, we're acknowledged if one of us should uh, die here suddenly. Uh, uh, Perhaps someone will have to identify our body. But uh, uh, dead persons, unless you're speaking in a profound spiritual self, uh, do, do not have selves. Only living people have selves. They inhabit their own circumstances. And the self is that quality of habitation that we have as we move. As we move through the world, we, we, are, we are able to get some purchase on who we are and what our possibilities are. Now that, those recognition systems are both physical as well as symbolic. The self is not just, uh, well, I have a bunch of ideas about who I am, so I think I'll point those out here. It's a deeply physical thing. We're, em we're embodied. We have recognition systems that uh, we couldn't even describe or know, but uh, that is part of how we function. There are many kinds of settings in which forms the self, in which the self operates. We're bodily, you know, we think of our hand as part of our self. We operate in environments, some of which we claim as our own, like perhaps our house or car. Uh, William James said the psyche is the fundamental to him, he's a psychologist, part of the self. It's the, uh, the thing we most prize are our, our thoughts and habits of awareness. Uh, many of us have social selves, the people who care about us, who know about us. We have cultural shells, selves. We live in the land of, uh, of uh, ideas you know, that, and skills that we claim as our own. The self is constituted in many ways. Uh, I will add, importantly, one tends to think of the self as a modernist conceit. Well, it's all about the individual, but it isn't really. Selves are collective as well. And again, our anthropologists would know that. You know, we, we do not separate ourselves from our families or from our friends or some, from the task group. We wish it well, we are part of that. Self can be collective as well as individual. Finish that off. What does realization mean? Uh, making real the possibilities of uh, situations, of the self in situations. Uh, play, as we'll see, is not just, let's talk about things. Play is a getting in there and doing things. I think Walter and Marsha are more inclined to say it's, it's a self-active thing, it's a self-actualization thing, but the realization is my way of saying that, that, that humans discover who they are by getting out there. In, in the process, they develop an orientation system, that recognition system, and the self is about, uh, what we do is build, build our capabilities for operating, for realizing who we are. Play, then. Uh, my book makes it sound like, uh, well, there's just play, and that's the only way you realize yourself, case closed. But that isn't true, you know. Karl Marx would say work is the place where you realize yourself. You create objects in the world. You look at those objects. That's how you confront who you work, work. Uh, many have said, no, it's in ritual that you discover who you are, where you stand in the great st stream of history. That's the great project of self-realization. Come on. Uh, others could say uh, love or community and who could argue with them. So this play is one. And in my own view, play's specific function, and this word is not my own, it's from a Harvard group that worked on these four kind of system requirements of living, but it was goal attainment, which what we do in play 
as we conceive possibilities, we develop strategies for realizing those, we play those out, we think about the implications of those. Play is a kind of a little lab school of sort, to use Piaget's Im imagery, where we kind of try out the possibilities of living. So play, and, and that's tremendously important. Okay, how are we doing? <laughs> uh, well, we started, right? Uh, Thinking about play, why is it so diffi difficult? Uh, in my book, I talk about this, so I'll be brief. Uh, here's six different ways. You could see play as action. What if you're sitting on a grassy knoll? That's a bad image. <laughs> <laughs> Unarmed. <laughs> and you're watching somebody play tennis. You could just focus on the tennis player. Look at them trying to do something. What are they doing? They're trying to put their body in motion. It's, a, it's kind of pattern, but it's kind of not. It's kind of, maybe that's what plays. Maybe it plays a form of action. A baloney, says Brian Sutton Smith. I don't like that approach. Plays a form of interaction. Come on. Didn't you see that there's a ball involved? Or to push it farther, there's a person across the net. It isn't just assimilation or action. It's, um, <coughs> it's interaction, back and forth. It's an interchange. That's what play is. Come on. No, say some people, and particularly our anthropologists, there's more to tennis than bopping a ball back and forth across the net. Didn't you see they're keeping score? They're resting between points, they're chatting, they're stretching. They're, there's a lot of things that go on in a game. So which of these should we call play? The little stuff, the interaction, the broader stretch of space and time. Well, if it was just physical movement, do this, do this, do this, I don't think any of us would be too interested. Play is other things as well. It's a disposition. Uh, Nina Lieberman is famous for that, talking about playfulness. Maybe there's some perky, inquisitive quality that players have, some desire to do this that animates the activity, because two people could be doing the same thing. For one, it's drudgery, and for other, it's play. What's that about? So there's some subjective component. Keep going. One of five, one of my old professors, and Peter Gray is right, he disavowed the idea that play is equivalent to flow, but uh, Mahai, Shikset Mahai, uh, uh, focused on experience. Play is about some capacity, some quality of enjoyment while you're doing it. That's what play is. It's not just doing stuff. It's some quality, and you can't understand it without that. And then lastly, and this is kind of stuffy and weird, but a, a, a tack that I take is play is a particular way of making meaning, what I call ascending meaning, which is to structure the understandings of things out of the particularities of what occur. And you can't know in advance what play is. You, uh, you have to kind of do it, and, and from the doing of it, you draw conclusions about uh, uh, what it is and what is to happen. So it's a particular project of meaning making. Well, I'll go fast here. Play. Play is different than work and uh, rich, ritual and that other stuff. As action, I think it's transformative. It's change making activity, people trying to do something to introduce innovation into the world. It's consummatory, a word that uh, spell check always flags when I use it. It is contained in the moment. It is consumed. It is, uh, it is intrinsic, but it is bounded. It, it draws its energy from within the activity itself. No, it's interaction. Okay, well then there's something about the direction of the interaction. It isn't just straight ahead. Uh, it, there's an unpredictability about it. And if it isn't unpredictable, the interaction, then it's not play. It's also contested, not in the sense of a competition, me against you, but where people, it could be a group, are trying to do something against potential worldly resistance. They're not just giving themselves to the world, as you might in ritual. They're contesting it. As activity, I think play is self-regulated. 
Walter and Marsha's uh, thing is self-active. Uh, somehow people are in control of their own, directing their own activity, managing that. And you've heard so many folks at the conference say, yeah, bad play, always get called it false play, is where it's managed by other people. That's very, very bad. And I agree with them <coughs> uh, that play, <laughs> I agree that play is self-managed, uh, self-managed activity. And an interesting part of it is so often it is episodic. What does that mean? A, a lot of activity is builds, builds. It's all connected. I do one thing, then another follows. But play tends to have hands of cards and innings and your turn. It tends to be episodic. So even those little moments are moment leading to moment. If, if the thing adds up to something, it's usually just an aggregation of those moments. Disposition, I call that uh, curiosity. Uh, there probably are better words for that. Kind of an impish interest that, that pl distinguishes play. You could do better than I did on that one. As experience, I think uh, Play has a particular um, a, a emotional transition that makes it different from ritual. And on your sheet, there's my uh, horrible chart of, of the different emotional transitions of the different uh, uh, four great uh, forms of human activity. Uh, but I think play has the kind of zestful quality of fun. It's kind of exciting. But then it comes to pauses, exhilaration, which I'll call being laughed out, being kind of played out, but then re-energizes. At the end, what's the experience of play? I, I would call it gratification, uh, where you're kind of self-pleased, self-pleased that you and other people have done this. Well, that's the same as work. No, I say on that sheet. Well, that's the same as ritual, like worship. No, I say I think that's quite different. I think uh, communitas is quite uh, different as well. I think that's the path to joy. Uh, rather than play, as this is just my opinion, uh, having your grandchild born or uh, you know, uh, having your son or daughter return from some long journey, that's joy. The otherness, otherness taking you up and you becoming part of that, that's play, play is great, but uh, Communitas has a joy all its own. There's my chart. It's, yeah, it's hardly readable there. Uh, and I'm not going to go through that. It's, it's on the sheet. What's the point of it? My point is that play is different than the other activities, but it's not entirely different. What? I think it shares some qualities with work. I think it shares some qualities with the communion or communitas. I think it does share some. But it is made different by its combination. Oh, that lessens play. No, it doesn't lessen play. It connects play to the other behaviors. I think it's the most different from ritual. That's a kind of off-the-wall thing to say. And perhaps the logic of my charge led me to that. I think its opposite <coughs> is the great vehicle of descending meaning, and that is ritual. Play is a great uh, vehicle of ascending meaning. They're wonderful things. They're different. It's only one path. You can see what I think the paths of the other ones are. I need to speed up. Okay. My theme is plays a pretty basic thing, but it gets complicated, just like work does, just like love does, just like worship does. It gets complicated. That, that doesn't mean that we uh, uh, lose sight of what is basic about it. M much of what you study here is uh, uh, combinations. Because you folks are not, don't live in uh, theoretical clouds quite in the same way I do. You study real people doing real play. And when that occurs, uh, real human events have combinations of these themes. So a bunch of people in class study, in class in, in this setting, study uh, work like play. 
building stuff, uh, working a crossword puzzle, David once called it, uh, serious leisure, there's an English man who has made his career on that concept, instrumental work, work, work at it, exercise, yeah, yeah that's, it can be playful, it, it bleeds toward work. Uh, some folks study ritualized play, I did a book once on us, Sport and Society in pre-industrial England. The uh, upper classes there in the old days had very emphasis on decorum and ritual, and that was almost more important than who won sportsmanship. Uh, there is communal play. A lot of people in this room do that. Uh, I went to Smith's uh, session on uh, you know play diplomacy. Well, what's the connection between play and community building? Tremendously important thing. But it's kind of uh, lives in that borderlands between the two. Play is a basic thing, but it involves different contexts. Uh, you've got that on your chart. I don't want to beat a dead horse. I'll, I'll be I'll be fast. Uh, how, how, what accounts for human behavior? How do we, how do we uh, explain it? There are many inputs to it. I'm up here behaving now. Oh, okay. Uh, you're, you must have ideas in your head and kind of ways, the ways you think and you're giving them to us. Yeah, I guess so. Uh, I'm embodied though. I've got it. Throats bother me. I'm old, cranky. I got a bunch of problems. Uh, I'm an embodied. It's an embodied. Pre I decided to wear my sport coat because Michael, Michael Pat's got his on too. So I mean, it's, it's, it's an embodied, uh, embodied thing. I'm trying to be sensitive to my group. You're the most knowledgeable play people in the world. Don't be boring up here. Uh, uh, adjust yourself to that situation. Culture, what are the ideas and skills that you folks already know? How can I communicate with those? What a challenge that is. Uh, and the environment, what about this thing and this thing and the distance of the room and can you hear me? And, and it, be, behavior is shaped by all of those inputs. They're both external to us, they also shape us. And here's my point then, which is, uh, yeah, and in play you select some of those as the focus for your activity. All that other stuff frames your activity. And then you pick out a ball from the environment and throw it up and down. You're picking out that one little theme, it distills that, or you're, you're uh, doing something with a story, okay, well that, that, that will be the focus. So out of all that we sort of focus, okay, play's a basic thing, but how we play depends on what we're playing with. This is a more recent idea of mine, very committed to this too, of course. Uh, well, place play. Well, no, it depends what you're playing with. Uh, some situations, well, I'll, I'll start with a story. Uh, I went to Walter and Marsha's workshop out there on the beach. Walter says, well, you know, some sand's kind of Soft, you could you could do that one, or some sand's really wet down there, or you could you could work with that, or or there's sand in the middle that's kind of neither too wet nor too dry, you know, and you, you could work with that, and and you might say, well, whatever, but no, the material, the material that you are confronting influences the way you operate, so. You're some big shot, some older kid. You could be playing with a little kid, and ideally you simulate peer relationship, but uh, uh, many situations and self-discovery are ones where we operate in systems of privilege, where I am more powerful than you, I can push you around. It's like playing with a beetle or something. That's a certain type of play. Some play, and a lot of folks in this room do this, is no, I'm interested in peer-based play, peer-based play, where, and Shakespeare and I was too, uh, where uh, more or less evenly matched. Play, see, play is kind of a case of give and take. It's a more equilateral sort of exchange. That's, that's what play is, okay. But there is also play that, uh, uh, that operates under conditions of subordination. You're out there surfing, you try to change those waves. They're too powerful for you. You're mountain climbing. You try to change that. You're playing music in an orchestra. You try to change that score. You operate within the terms of that. 
you, you give yourself to that form, but you assert yourself in what ways that you can. I call that uh, the, the position of subordination, but the prospect is of interpretation. And then there's last, and maybe most interesting to me, is uh, where you stand outside uh, the situation slightly, right at the edges, and you sort of hypothesize about what's going on, and you speculate, and you imagine, and you muse, and th that, I think, uh, Gregory Bateson wrote about that a lot, uh, that, I think, is the kind of quintessential uh, play posture. Per uh, the other's tremendously important, but that kind of starting point of getting ready to jump in. So do you see there are four different places where you can experience yourself and play a response to those four different ways. Well, this is review here, so I'll do a minute on each. Constructive play, like, again, not to keep picking on Walter and Marcia, but, but what they tend to do, come into our sessions and build something, make something from the inert elements of the world, make something, create something, regard what you've created. Block play would be an example. And there are some famous people up there who've taken that approach. No, say others, well not no, but like Eva Nuoka does studies of literature and learning, interpretation, you know, how little kids make sense of things where the subject accepts the terms and operates within those. So story, play, uh, dramatic play, musical performances, and there are some uh, famous people, Vivian Paley, etc., who've taken that approach. No, our folks, many of our folks say, I'm interested in dialogical play, that equals these stuff, where you encounter the world on relatively equal terms, you assert, you adjust, you push, you respond. Lots of games and debates and flirtations and rough and tumble play does that. Brian Sutton Smith had his dialectical theory of play, one of his many theories. And you can see some other theorists who've taken that approach as well. And last, this idea of play is exploration, where you step back, where you're not involved, deeply, in flow, like Schick said behind was in, you're not, you're on the edges of things. And I don't mention him here, but the great theorist of that was Ge or Georg Simmel in sociology, but uh, Bakhtin, her, George Herbert Mead, or Freud, that kind of thinking about the character of the world and just kind of dabbling at it or touching at it, often as a prelude to the other types. Well, there's a little chartlet, I think you've got that one too, that kind of compares uh, behaviors, uh, the footwork types of play, and, off, and also suggests that, well, that constructive stuff, that sounds all kind of work-like, really, where you're kind of making something, and I do think it's a kind of prelude to work. Well, that dialogical battery and teasing, getting in the mix stuff, so feeling out people, and that kind of sounds like the project of communitas, you know, the kind of bonding stuff that a lot of we're interested in. Yeah, it, maybe it's a prelude to that. And then the interpretive musical playing, that, that in some ways is a prelude, the playful take on ritual, where you try to discover the principles by which you live and you, you acknowledge otherness. Well, this is repeat then, so fast on this stuff. Work like play. Build it up, take it apart, see some results, train, try to maintain control. Ideally, we'd like to see development or progress. Look at what you've done, show it to others, talk about it. The process of invention, I call it. It prepares for work's a project of adaptation. Figuring out the best way to do stuff that work. Workers don't dally. Gee, how I do it. They get right to it. Play is kind of a staging ground for that. To ritual, great, great thing. Be an anthropologist in your second life. 
uh, trying to find useful forms to live in, external forms and forces one can rely on for guides for thought. Uh, uh, play ain't ritual, but it's, it, it prepares for it, and it participates in the project of discovery. There's invention, let me make something. Discovery, let me try to discover something that's already there. They, they ain't exactly the same thing. They're, they're opposite trajectories. Anyway, rituals about values, clarification, pattern maintenance, uh, play anticipates and prepares for that. Dialogical play, you've got it. I don't need to kind of dwell on this. What are the possibilities for collective involvement for diplomacy? What, what can we do to in one another's presence? Tremendously important, you folks study it. I don't need to talk about it. I think play uh, prepares for that possibilities of integration. But play is more active, assertive, self-generated than the communitas is. And lastly, exploratory play, which I think is this kind of posing, what can I do with the world? What would I like to do with the world? Well, I'd like to do this. And Freud said, you know, it isn't just fantasy. You put your stuff into action. It's self, self-active. Now, maybe at the last meetings, or maybe the one before, I said, well, here's a different twist that we should acknowledge. There can be orderly and disorderly kinds of play. Let's, let's recognize both. I mean, I'm into orderliness, what I call green play. But come on, let's recognize the Brian Sutton Smith thing, which is, come on, play can also be disorderly and impish and crazy and kids telling vulgar stories and drawing bad pictures and stuff. You know, play can be that too. Play is about irreverence too. And I'm not a fan of Nietzsche, but he did try to work that territory of the Apollonian versus Dionysian rituals, you know. Apollo all about the clarity and wisdom and order and stability and Dionysius about uh, uh, wildness and wantonness and destabilization. Uh, uh, I'm not much of a postmodernist, but there is construction, there's also deconstruction. And people in the room would say, yeah, yeah, they're both involved in the same thing. But there, there's the project of construction. Let me make something great. And there's the project of deconstruction. Let me tear down that sandcastle. So there's four workings out of that. I'll be fast. Men Walters workshop. Yeah, let me build something. Now, people, I want you to tear it apart. Wow. That's the, that would be the, in fact, I want you to go tear apart hers. <laughs> Let's tear that apart. Well, that wouldn't be nice, Walter. Well, that's play too, isn't it? Is, is there taking up and also taking down? Is taking down a legitimate activity? Do we learn as much by taking down, opposing, deconstructing as we do by building? Interpretive play. Let's tell a nice story and what it means and no, says Brian Sutton Smith, it's, it's about rebellious antics and counter stories and messing people up, and that's a play too. It's not nicey nice play perhaps, but it's play. Dialogical play, green play, let's work together. Bernie DeCoven's a great man. He spoke to us last year, I think. He, he's a champion of let's build communities, people, new play. Let's be our better selves, people through play. All for that. But Heusinger is, now nah, plays about the Hagon or Hagon. You know, it's like, it's about competition and clash. And come on, recognize that, acknowledge that. Dialogue can mean adversity too. And then exploratory play. Uh, that can be, uh, yeah, wonderful, orderly, amusing. Or, or it can be about what some people, not many of us here, speculate on as dark play, moving into the cell. Is it possible even to the activities that destabilize the psyche, the kind of going, going inside? And many of us would say, that ain't play. That's too, that's too destructive. That's not play. But others would say, well, some elements of that, th there is building, and there is taking, taking down, even in the imagination. Well, there's a chart. Uh, blessed 
year, the year before I had red and green, but then I changed colors, whatever. Uh, each, uh, uh, this was for some journal article that's coming out. Uh, but the point is, yeah, yeah, the four forms you're talking about, you're saying they all, they all have their red and green functions, right? Yeah, that's right, that's right, that's enough. How does this, uh, how does distinction mongering like I do help us in any way? You could say, I'm an empiricist, I, I don't know what you're doing up there. Or, I, I, I'm a, I'm a I, I do applied studies. Come on, pal, give me something I can work with. Uh, I do think that uh, being fastidious like this uh, helps us identify when play, uh, behavior is more playful. You know, Peter Gray said that. Uh, it helps us identify aspects of play to study. That's the David Kushner principle, which is, when, are, are some uh, activities more transformative? Oh, would they have different results than more, you know, accepting conformative ones? Well, I don't know, we haven't studied that. How about con consummatory or intrinsically motivated activities versus extrinsically one or results-oriented one? Uh, Peter Gray said, uh, you know, just reward them one time, you've changed the project entirely. Oh, well, I could study that, I guess, how reward system operate in, in play. Does that change the results? So it isn't just play in general I'm studying, but certain aspects of play and how they affect people. Unpredictability versus pre more predictable forms. Contested versus more integrated for bonding types. How about self-regulated versus other direct, other regulated, like the teacher, kind of, or the lead, play leader, uh, Fraser would talk about, uh, directing us. Does that achieve different outcomes? So, uh, and the episodic versus all connected up. So for those folks who are more empirical in spirit, it's like, yeah, yeah, I need to take play apart and study how different aspects of play kind of uh, operate. I think I could get farther. Finish it off. Uh, maybe it's useful, maybe it's not. Maybe you have your own approach. That's fine. Is it possible to try to think systematically about different types of play rather than here's some different types of play? You know, and my approach may be silly, but it, it, it is systematic for good or ill. Uh, how is play connected to the other basic things human beings do? Uh, much is blended functions. And we should be alert to the possibilities of both orderly and disorderly play. And think about that. One of my friends who's a great teacher said, uh, the, the, uh, the, the greatest teachers have a high toleration of mass. I don't myself, but he is a great teacher. And, but, and just that, yes, to be a great teacher is to invite disorder and mess and then to deal with that. Well, fine, I'm finishing here. Uh, yeah, Tom great self-realization, right, good, good. And, and that's it, right? No, say some other people. Brian Sutton Smith, last book. Last essay, play as emotional survival said, no, but he, he, he would raise his hand or not raise his hand and say, no, I think it's a place about emotional consultation. There are these six basic emotions. Paul Ekman went around the world and showed people pictures and said, hey, what's this person feeling and why are they feeling this way? And he decided there were six basic emotions, uh, sadness, surprise, fear, anger, disgust, and happiness that we recognize. And uh, then Brian's last book was, uh, yeah, and I think the play forms we know are built as uh, responses trying to get those emotions into operation, those primary emotions. So our festivals, our attempts for us to address and deal with sadness, our uh, haunted houses, our attempts to deal with uh, uh, fear. It is his view, and I support it, the triumph of optimism over uh, fear and cringing, and especially depression. He thought the opposite play is depression. It's a very uh, thought-provoking thing, he said. Uh, Here's something else, though. You've listened to all my stuff very patiently, and you're saying, well, oh, whatever. Uh, 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 I think play is a way that people develop relationships. It's self stuff. That's nice. Thank you. But I think it's a way that human beings develop a relationship. That's what play is about. It's a social thing, people. 
And there are great people, including Martin Buber and others, who have said that very thing. The self, you can't separate the self from the relationships in which it's realized. Play is about relationship building. Last thing, uh, play is a creator of meanings. Huh? It, it, that's the purpose of play, which is to uh, develop understandings of uh, what the world is like, what society is like, what other people are like, what culture is like. That's what we're about. It is a particular way of constructing understandings of the world. Well, nobody believes that. Well, that was Hoisinger's theme in Homo Ludens. He didn't care anything about children's play. He didn't care anything about individualism particularly. That's just a tiny bit at the start. What's his book about? It's about the possibilities of societies realizing who they are and moving forward into the future because they play out their ideas on the playground. It's about creating meaning. It's not about this uh, self-self that the uh, speaker up here just uh, went through. So there can be other things that play is. Okay, last bit then, I've had my say. What I'd like, and we didn't, we don't have a lot of time, but then we got started late. Uh, I'd, uh, we have some pieces of paper that uh, Michael Pat was nice enough to uh, pass around. I've been up here gabbing, but here, here's your prompt. So much for me. What aspects of play, particularly different from anything you've heard up here from the last couple of days, Peter Gray, me, whoever, have been important in your own work on play? Have they been under-recognized by the play studies community? You're the people who are doing this. What, what needs to come forward or what seems important to you? And you may keep it, but I would like to collect it myself so I could see your reflections. So please start on that. If that one doesn't turn you on, uh, I and other people am interested in that second one, which is uh, what issues seem uh, key to you for the development of this uh, interdiscipline, whether it's empirical or applied stuff, or whether it's uh, idea mongering like uh, I do. So write one and two. You can see three or two, which is, I don't want to write about either of that stuff, but I'll write you something. I'll write you something. And if we have time, we'll hear out, we'll hear out what some of the folks say before, they, uh, uh, before we have to vacate the room. So have that. Thank you. Would it be possible to share anything that you've said? I've had my shot, but uh, I get to read what you would say. Would anybody uh, oh, just share their thoughts? Maybe we could hear from a few different people about that first theme. What do we need to be focusing on? Thank you. So, um, I have another question, and um, I was thinking that given that play leads to self-realization, it enhances social relationships, it helps, steers us in the direction of more moral development, and all these good things. So, uh, can we leverage play to develop a response to hate and violence? And can we uh, think of play um, as a play diplomacy as a thing, and if it is a thing, what does it look like, what would it be like, what would be the work of play diplomacy? Yeah, thank you. I mean, that's what I get out of your session, too, which is a collective realization. What would that mean yes. instead of individual steps? Some, somebody, just your thoughts, your reflections. Thank you. Yeah. I've had my moment in the sun. What, what thoughts on what we need to do as an interdisciplinary? So something I'm, I'm more interested in, and I've read a little bit about it, but I think a, a lot of it apparently has been lost in historical record, which is uh, tribal groups that would have communal ceremonies and events of communal ecstasy. And uh, 
and, and that's closer to your spirit. That's that Dionysian kind of red play, red play, collective identity exploring itself, destabilizing itself. Yeah, that's a, an important, interesting theme. Do we need to do it here? I don't think so. Uh, my professor, uh, Victor Turner, said there's a ritual process, stages you go through. Is there also a play process? We have an approach. He thought rituals transform people. Well, maybe play does too. Is there a play process? Uh, I don't see anybody writing about that, but it, uh, that's a big deal. Yeah, I mean, you can sum it up as a carnival, you know, a, a carnival society. In a sense. Yes, and that's that's a, a red play, inverted order. It's a, it's also a theology of its own sort. But I think it so, has to be well documented in ethnography. Yeah. I mean, I think, I mean, even if you look at people like Wendy James' book yeah. um, on, on performance and ritual, there is a lot of work that's been, and not even just the ethnographic work that's been done on that, but just the yeah. thinking and the cross cultural comparisons that's been done on that work, the, and the role of shamanistic culture, and the role yeah. of, you know, there's a lot of documentation from South America and the Yadamani yeah. to, to work on how our work on, like, you know, uh, so, uh, North American and, 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 and Arctic, Arctic groups. There's a lot of work on that. What what needs to what needs to be done? Every what do you think needs to be done? What does play need to attend to? Well, I like the piece that you had about the specificity because I also think that you know this idea that we you know one of the things that I thought about is um, the idea that we're we're as a as a kind of um, I guess it's a, maybe it's a function of English language that we're very prone to um, be comfortable with labels. Um, I don't yeah. think that, ca and, and category kind of based thinking, mm. that I think that is um, not necessarily very precise. So I think that there are a number of categories like that, I, like friendship, for example, is another one that yeah. I thought about. Friendship, particularly in childhood, is very generally considered. What does being friends mean? Mm -hmm. um, friendship in adulthood is very different than friendship in childhood. Can we and can we say that being friends in, as adults is exactly the same as being friends in childhood? Mm -hmm. And so, yet yeah, people use that term like children are friends, adults are friends, and we consider that mm -hmm. interchangeably in our language. But yet, I don't think those two operations as a, as a cultural or social act are the same thing. And so I think that there should be more precision and we should interrogate category thinking much more precisely. I think uh, mathematics is the only thing that can claim to have, you know, be not mutable in any sense. So I think being more precise is, as you suggested, the, the way forward and to define things. But then, but yet, then I think the problem comes in when everyone finds things in their own way. Yeah. And and I thought you know not to see not to see like overly critical, but when we have green play and red play and three thousand different labels for things, how do we and oh Brian Brian Seven Smith has a million categories, and you're offering categories. How do we bring things together that we're all actually on the same page? Um, with, with things too, so that we're not offering, you know, 25 of solutions for the same problem. Yes. So that can actually help make the problem work. Yes, I hear you. Uh, I guess I would like that we could be on the same page, but being on the same page, we can be at different places on, right. places on the page. Right, exactly. You can imagine a young professor saying, you're guilty of essentialism. That's a terrible, terrible thing. But uh, I support uh, I support her. No, uh, respect the context in which people uh, make their meanings. And uh, it, it's a fluid, complicated thing. Don't oversimplify it, buddy. Uh, last comment, yeah. Um. I think the thing that's missing from your presentation <coughs> was the therapeutic value of play, which oh, I'm yeah. very clear about, and it may be contained in a lot of your yeah. categories, but I think it's so important that, that it really should be mentioned. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, in a way. 
Thank you. Yeah, yeah. How do you speak to uh, broken people through ritual, through work, through play, as you say, or through loving communion? I think you'd say, well, several of those combined, my friend. But thank you. That's, anybody else want to have a last uh, word? Uh, you have to go to your session. Uh, thank you all for coming. I, I, I will enjoy reading your book.